Good morning. If you want to join with us, we're going to sing We Have Come to Join in Worship on 207 or on the screen. so many of you here together in the sanctuary this morning. Church Online, good morning, welcome, thank you for being part of our uh, service here this morning and our congregation and our church family here as well. We welcome you. Uh, if you all who are here would pull your bulletins out, please. Uh, just a few things we want to highlight for you. Uh, there's several inserts in your bulletins and we want to kind of draw your attention to some of the things that are going on in and around the church here. First of all, worship ministry team uh, will be meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 here at the church. So if you're part of the team or would like to be part of that team, you can come out and join us tomorrow night. Yesterday morning, if you missed our men's fellowship breakfast yesterday morning, you've got another chance coming up this coming Saturday. So this coming Saturday, 7.30 at the... Walnut Bottom Diner in Carlisle, and that is uh, men and women uh, fellowship breakfast there. It's at 7.30 in the morning, come out early Saturday morning, get a good breakfast, get ready for the day, then go home and do all your work. If you are interested in purchasing uh, fundraiser tickets for Paul Pax for Redemption Barbecue in Shippensburg, you can see Royetta today, the last day for that. Today is your last day, so make sure you... Make sure you check in with her for your tickets after services here this morning. There's a note on your bulletins about the mission board looking for a coordinator for our ARC program. If you're new or relatively new to our church, uh, we did not misspell that, A-R-K-K, Acts of Random Kindness Kids, works in tandem with our junior church program. Uh, so if you are interested in that or have some questions about that, you can talk with Pastor Don or myself or see Carl uh, at sometime after church or this week. Uh, we will be hanging this flyer up on the bulletin board uh, after services here. This is a blessing of the bikes service on April 21st, uh, next Sunday, April 21st, at the Big Spring Presbyterian Church. And so that will be back for your information later. In your bulletin are two inserts. I want to draw your attention to those. Actually, in your bulletin, there are four inserts. I just want to point out two of them. First one says, help stop human trafficking. Um, that is a presentation on human trafficking given by Greg Hench. 
Uh, those of you that know Greg, Greg is the youth pastor at Carlisle Church of God. Um, Greg is actually one of the oldest living youth pastors in the world. Um, <laughs> and if he were here, he would not mind me saying that. Uh, Greg is going to be giving a presentation on several organizations that he is affiliated with that are helping to fight against human trafficking. That is coming up next Sunday at 6 p.m., light refreshments at 5.30 and a service at 6 o'clock. Uh, so put that on your radars. The second insert is for our VBS. Uh, our theme this year is the Great Jungle Journey. And on the back of the insert, so the front of it has the big VBS logo. On the back, the picture of the gorilla or baboon or ape or some animal of that nature. You can correct me on that later. Uh, on the back is some information on some of the adult and youth volunteer positions that we have. Um, tour guides or crew leaders, other helpers. There's also some things to donate there. And there's also a note about a prayer ministry that we're starting now for our VBS. And so you can read over those. Uh, two things that are new on our registration table out there. Uh, one of them is sign-up sheets for those various volunteer positions. We just put those out this morning, and so you can check those out on your way out this morning. There's also um, more paper and leaves. If you're cutting out leaves, and some of you have been doing that and bringing those back in, we now have a basket out there to put your cut leaves in. And so there's lots of paper, there's more templates, there's the basket to collect them in, um, and the sign-up sheets are back there. So if you have any questions on anything VBS, you can catch me after church or sometime this week. Perennials. Now, if you're part of our perennials and you're going to the Bird in Hand uh, lunch and then a show, um, if you're signed up for the ride in the van, uh, please be at the church for a prompt 9 a.m. departure on Saturday, April 27th. Uh, we'll have bottles of water for the ride over and a few snacks as well. Uh, if you are also free to bring your own. And we'll hang this up on the bulletin board out back out in the foyer after service. Last announcement that I have uh, on a very special anniversary, 51 years celebrating today. And I don't want to embarrass them, so I won't mention their names, but you can see Jake and Eileen and wish them happy anniversary. <laughs> <later>. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep. I would ask Eileen what the secret to 51 years is, but I noticed that Jake is not in here with you, so maybe, maybe that's the secret. I don't know. <laughs> Jake is our, our greeter out front this morning. Are there other, that was a whole lot of information coming at you. Please do read through your bulletin sometime after church today. Uh, pay attention to dates, times, and as always, if you have questions, get in touch with Pastor Don or myself or someone from the office. Are there other announcements to be shared here this morning? Anything we have missed? All right. Seeing none, then, we're going to move into our mission moment. Uh, Carl's going to come and share about our Helping Hands ministry. adjusted now okay uh, who knows about a helping hands in our church anybody does anybody know about it? raise your hands high so I can see them okay we have a helping hand ministry here and uh, there's a few guys of us that get together and do it and if there's any ladies that want to join or any other guys that want to join us that you can write your name down write your phone number down so I can contact you what we do is we collect a lot of refrigerators stoves, dishwashers, um, air conditioners. Our biggest ones are refrigerators and air conditioners. We, as soon as we get them, they're gone. So uh, I just want to let you know we have a big unit coming in now, a big air unit, and a dishwasher, and a stove, and a refrigerator. So if there's any needs, contact me or the pastors, either one of them, and they'll let me know. Uh, if there's any needs anywhere, then we can get them to them. If you know of anybody that's getting rid of some of theirs that are in good condition, let, let us know. That way I can write them down and we ha have a head count for someone that needs them. We can do them then. Thank you very much for helping out.
And what Carl shared there is one of the many ways that you can give to the ministry work that the Dublin Gap Church of God does. So be mindful of that. Um, when, when you see that on your order of service every Sunday when you come in here, we're, we're, not, we're not talking, we're not quite honestly, we're not talking about your money. We're talking about you. How can you give to God's ministry work, kingdom work that he's doing through the Dublin Gap Church of God? Um, and then as the Holy Spirit speaks into your heart, make the necessary contacts. Sometimes that means calling Carl up and saying, hey, I have a refrigerator, it still works, but it, we redid our kitchen and it doesn't fit anymore. We'd love to take that off your hands. So heavily in the appliances, if you know there's a community need also for somebody that needs some repairs done and they don't have the finances to do it, um, let us know. I'm not saying we can help with each and every one because it depends on the skill set required for that but we have some folks that are very gifted in our congregation with the ability to fix things. Amen? You know who you are. Um, and uh, if we can coordinate that, that's also the way we give into our community because we represent... Who do we represent? God, Jesus, the one who was a carpenter's son, the one who knew how to fix things. And not just spiritually fix things, but he also knew how to fix things. We don't read about that because the Bible is about that spiritual connection. But imagine him growing up under Joseph's instruction. This is how you make a table, this is how you make chairs, this is how you make fill in the blank with whatever a carpenter would be making during that time of his education. And he gave to his community with the abilities that he had as he learned that skill from his earthly father. So, if you have a skill set that would be helpful to the Helping Hands ministry, let Carl know. If you have items that would be helpful to the Helping Hands ministry, let Carl know. I'm putting it back on him. <laughs> um, but if you can't reach him, you know, Brian and I can take that information and we'll pass it along. So seek multiple ways in which you can give into God's mission work that he's doing through the body here that calls itself the Dublin Gap Church of God. Amen? Amen. We are going to do things just a little bit differently in our service here today as we normally do. Uh, we're going to take some time now and enter into a time of prayer. You can see on the prayer rail in front of me, we have several prayer shawls uh, up here that we're going to take some time and pray over. This has also been a very uh, heavy weekend, a very busy weekend at the church with memorial services and celebrations of life services. Um, and so we're going to specifically take some time this morning as a church, as the body of Christ, as members of the community, and we're going to pause and we're going to lift up some of these, these families in these situations. Uh, very specifically, we're going to pray over uh, Hazel Holtry and her family, as yesterday was John's celebration of life service. We're going to pray over um, the Kelly family, as that celebration of life service will be here this afternoon. Uh, we received word this morning that Doris Burkholder passed away last night. We're going to pray over the Burkholder family. Uh, we're going to pray over our pastor, who came home from days away and got slammed headfirst into um, an intense weekend of ministry. And so we're going to pray over him and his family today as well. So I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer over encouragement and uplifting for these families, uh, for these memorial services, and over Don and Tammy. And then uh, at the end of that, we're going to transition into praying over our prayer blankets, our prayer shawls. And at that point, I will invite anyone who feels led to come up and, and lay hands on the shawls and pray uh, to do that, and then Don will lead the prayer over those shawls. And from that point, we'll move into our, our call to worship. So changing things up on you just a little bit this morning, but I'm pretty confident that, that we can handle this. Right. Are you ready, church? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning because you are the giver of all good things. Lord, every breath that we take, 
every opportunity that we have to serve and to show your love to others, it comes from you. We love others because you first loved us. We thank you this morning that we have the freedom to come and join together here this morning freely, openly, comfortably in this place that we call our home church. Thank you for that this morning. Thank you for those blessings today. Jesus, we come to you this morning, and we want to lift up these members of our church family, these members of our community that we know are, are hurting. We believe that for the believer, death is a passage. It's a step from this life into the next with you. And for that reason, Lord, we are grateful that we, we have comfort in that. But Lord, in this life, there's still, there's still a hole there. There's still a gap. And so this morning, we just want to lift up Hazel and her extended family and John's extended family to you. Thank you for the celebration that we had yesterday. Thank you for the show of love and support that came from the family and from the community and from our church. Uh, thank you that we know that John was a believer and that he is now resting comfortably in your presence. But we pray your continued strength for their family today and tomorrow and throughout this week and in the weeks and months to come day by day. Would you be very present with each of them in a way that only you can be? Would you fill them with a quiet confidence that no matter what the days bring, you will see them through? Father, we lift up to you the services this afternoon for the Kelly family. We pray that even now you would fill this church with such a strong presence of your spirit that all of us would walk out of here today feeling like we've been in your presence and that that presence of your spirit would continue to dwell here where we know that, that you are not confined to the walls of this church, but we're asking that you would anoint this place with a special anointing of your spirit today to bring comfort, to bring peace, to bring strength, to bring whatever is needed, to bring the right words at the right time from the right person so that when those who are here today feel like they can't take that next step, that you are there with them and that you will strengthen them to take that step, that you will surround them with your love, you will surround them with your family, you will surround them with your children, and you will strengthen them to take that next step and the next step and the next step. Day by day, moment by moment, Lord, we lift them all into your care. And we pray that you would be honored and glorified through all that is said and done in this place today, both through our service this morning and through our service this afternoon. Father, we lift up the Doris Burkholder family to you as that uh, is a very fresh hurt there. And we just pray that you would continue to minister as you already have been and that you would see, through, see that family through this time of transition. Lord, I pray over our pastor and his wife today. I pray over their family. Thank you that they were able to have a few days away. And I just thank you that you brought them back safely. And Lord, it's been a, a very long weekend of, of services and uh, we're not done yet. And so I pray a special filling of your spirit in our pastor today. As he stands up here in a few minutes to proclaim your word and, and to give the message that you have put on his heart, Lord, may it fall on receptive hearts and ears. Would you open our hearts and our minds to the words that he will speak? And would you speak powerfully through him? And Father, this afternoon as he leads the service, would you strengthen him as he shepherds, as he leads, as he guides, as he is the, the visible face of our church this afternoon? Would you strengthen him? And when those times are done, Father, would you give he and Tammy times of rest and times of refreshment, and times of renewal. Father, thank you for the honor and privilege of being able to pray to you anytime, anywhere, for anything. And so as we get ready, Lord, to pray over these prayer shawls, I'm going to invite any of you who are here this morning that feel so led to come up and lay hands on these shawls. You may now come up. And in just a moment, Lord, we're going to continue this time of prayer as we pray over these shawls.
Dear Heavenly Father, this has been a ministry that we have been engaged in here for probably going on two years now. And it's a ministry that you have been using to bring evidence of your hands, your love, your care, your protection, your concern, your, oh, your heart to those individuals that we have brought before you at this prayer rail. And today is no exception to that. So, Father, as we lift up Kate to you, uh, whose mom passed away suddenly, that's always a difficult, difficult time. Uh, oftentimes, there's not a chance to have said goodbye or to, to make sure that things were right in relationships. And it's just all of a sudden you're hit in the face with, mom's no longer here kind of thing. So, Father, as Kate and her family goes through this transition, goes through this time of grieving, uh, my prayer for them is that they grieve, not as the world grieves, but that they can stand firm in the hope of the resurrection that we have in you, Jesus, and that that will provide strength and peace during a time where their weakness is manifested, in times where their lack of peace is very evident. So reveal yourself in a mighty way to Kate and to her family. And then for Colleen, as she had to pass the sudden, had to experience the suddenness of the passing of her husband. Uh, Father, the same thing that we prayed in the passing of a parent applies almost tenfold to when it's a, a spouse, somebody that uh, you've shared life with together. So as Colleen tries to get her feet firmly on ground again when the ground just seems to be shifting, uh, Father, may you provide that strength from your spirit. Don't know where Colleen stands with the Lord, but, Father, I know that she is not beyond your touch. If she's part of your family, may the presence of the Holy Spirit in her fill her so that she can stand upon the firm rock that is Jesus. If she is not yet a believer, Father, I just ask that you would bring that awareness of who you are through your Son and that during this time of loss, during this time of suffering, during this time of grieving, she would reach out and reach up. Because, Jesus, you make the promise that if anyone calls out, you reach down and save. So just be with Colleen and her family as they go through this, the suddenness of this loss, uh, the, the heartache of this loss, and, and dare I say the anger that will come alongside of that as well. Uh, but, Father, just speak to them through loving hands, through your body, as they come around her and provide that comfort that only your children can provide because of the hope they have in Jesus. And Father, as we pray for Nick, he's going through a, a battle with lung cancer as we pray an anointing over this shawl, as he receives this shawl and as he accepts it on behalf of your people, may he feel your presence. We know that there's no quote-unquote power in the shawl, but there's power in the anointing. So Father, in that anointing, may... We're going to pray that it, if it is your will, because we know you can heal. We know that you can get rid of every cell that is cancerous. We know that you can restore his lungs to a precancerous condition. We know that you can extend his life uh, beyond what the doctors feel he might have. Uh, so, Father, we're just going to pray that it, if it be your will, that you would provide that miraculous healing, that you would provide that delivery from this disease of cancer. And that you would do it in a way that reveals your power, your authority, and your healing touch. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to lift these three individuals, these three families, these three situations before you. We acknowledge that you have already been active in each of these situations. We just are praying this morning for a further manifestation of your presence, manifestation of your power, manifestation of the anointing that happens when people pray. So, Father, that's our prayer request, that's our desire, that's our intercessory role that we are playing here this morning. And we also want to lift up Kathy Rommel as she is continuing to struggle with the healing from that foot surgery. Uh, there was an infection that was, that was noticed and that is present. We just pray, Father, that right now, in this hour, in this moment, as we are praying here, seeking your touch, that your touch would also fall upon her. And in this moment, in this hour, that, that infection is gone. In this moment, in this hour, that 
uh, un- unknownness of what is led to and, and how it's impacting her body. That is a-, a past conclusion because you have brought a healing to her body. Because I know where she will bring the honor and glory and praise to. She'll bring it right to the throne room. She'll share that Jesus stepped in and as the great physician brought the healing. That's our prayer this morning. Uh, Father, we are thankful that we can bring anything to you, big, small, in between. And you not only hear, but you are actively involved in the situations, even before we bring them, but in a, I don't understand it fully, but in a deeper supernatural way, you get deeper involved. I don't know how, how it works, but I know it works that way. And that's why you tell us to keep praying, to always pray. You inspired through your Holy Spirit to have Paul write those letters. And and in those letters, express the importance of prayer. Especially when he said, pray without ceasing. So may we be found to be those kind of prayer warriors. Who pray without ceasing. Who who are giving thanks continually. Whether it it was written to the church at Thessalonica. Or whether it was written to uh, the church at at Philippi. Uh, It's written for us today, the church at Dublin Gap. So guide us in all our prayer time, hear these prayers that we offered here this morning on behalf of those that you have brought into our sphere of understanding, into our sphere of connection. And may we consistently be in prayer for them as you, Holy Spirit, bring them to our mind. These things we pray in the name of Jesus as together we say, amen. If you are able, we invite you to stand together with us at this time for our call to worship. Here are the words that the Holy Spirit inspired David to write in Psalm 25. Show me your ways, Lord, teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior and my hope is in you all day long. Do not remember the sins of my youth, my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Have you ever looked at something for some insane amount of time trying to figure it out, and eventually you had to ask someone for help, and they did it in about 12 seconds, what you could not do in about 40 minutes? Not long ago, I was trying to reset something on my phone. It was one of those mandatory updates which changed a bunch of stuff that I wanted to change back. And I'm not very phone literate, and so after a few very frustrating minutes of not being able to figure it out, I handed it over to my teenage son and said, here, fix this. (laughs) And it wasn't long before he had it back in the way it, it was supposed to be, the way that I wanted it. See, God is not all that different. We need only to ask. May Psalm 25 be a prayer for each of us today. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach, you, teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's worship, church.
standing. And we're going to jump right into God's Word this morning as we begin a journey. How many of you like to go on journeys? Like to, how many of you like to go on trips? Okay, every week. <laughs> Not work trips, we're talking about. How many of you just like to go out and, haha, uh-huh, without any planning, go on a trip? Spontaneity, spontaneity. How many of you got to have everything planned out, but you love the trip? Eh, that's my wife. She's our planner. And I'm thankful she is. Otherwise, I'd get lost. Trust me. We're going to begin a journey through the book, through the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. So turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 1. This is going to take us a while to get through this. So I, I hope you've had a good breakfast because uh, we're going to go through the book of Romans today. Romans today and... Uh, We'll eventually let you out for supper. No, what we're going to do in the coming weeks and months, and dare I say into next year, we're going to go pretty much a verse by verse, walk through, journey through the letter of Romans. Some theologians uh, call this probably the, the uh, most descriptive theological letter that has ever been written. Um, and if you want to know about what is the theology behind the Christian faith, uh, Romans would be a good place to start. So, we're going to read those first 17 verses, so I encourage you to follow along if you can. If you can't, then pay attention and listen and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. This is a letter that Paul wrote, so he starts off his letter. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel that he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be, say it together with me, church, saints. Hmm. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's gift, by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks. King James says barbarians there. I kind of love that word. Both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed, and this is our, these are our two key verses for today. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the application of his holy word. You may be seated. Uh, You have in your bulletin this morning, as Brian mentioned, you have several handouts. One is our note page for this morning, so I would encourage you to get that out. At the top it says, Walking the Roman Road. Uh, And we're going to talk about I'm not ashamed of the gospel this morning. That's kind of going to be where our focus is going to, where it's going to end, and the challenge is going to be from it. But we're going to have a journey to get there. And, and just to give a, a little bit of the 21st century contemporary context where this is applied, 
How many of you know, oh, let's start this way. How many of you are football fans? Just raise your hand and keep them up for a minute, okay? Keep them up. How many of you know Tim Tebow? Ah, did you see there were more hands that came up that weren't football fans, but they know Tim Tebow? This insert in your bulletin um, that Greg Hench is going to be speaking about, that human trafficking, especially with children and the poor kind of thing, uh, that's that Tim Tebow foundation that's on there. That's the T Tim, Tim, Tim Tebow. I'll get it right. Let me share with you something that was passed on to me about his faith and about his experience in, how many of you know he played for the Denver Broncos? How many of you know he played for the New York Jets? Uh. How many of you know he played for the Jacksonville Jaguars? Uh. How many of you know he was on the New York Mets, um, I guess it was a triple A or double A baseball team? How many of you know that Tim Tebow is a born-again believer? See, once again, you see that? Listen, former football player Tim Tebow has always been about football and faith. And when it came to his playing career, his belief in God was pushed into the national spotlight. How many of you remember that? Tebow never shied away from sharing his faith, whether it was playing for the Florida Gators, the Denver Broncos, a New York Mets minor league team, or as a tight end for the Jacksonville Jaguars. In an interview on Outkicks, Don't At Me with Dan Dakic, Tebow said he wouldn't know if his faith would have cost him a lengthy NFL career, but it didn't matter. Tebow explained, I would just say what, what Jesus has done for me is, is everything. So my faith hasn't really cost me anything. My faith in Jesus and what Jesus has done for me has given me everything. It's given me a real hope. It's given me a meaning. It's given me a purpose for being. It's given me a hope of heaven. It's given me a joy of life. It's given me a love for people. Even in the midst of my mistakes and shortcomings and failures in life, I am not defined by my scars. I'm defined by his. Tebow continued adding that he owes everything he has to God. He said, I'm just grateful for everything he's done in my life and hopefully the things he'll do in the future. I don't look at anything that's happened to me as my faith has cost me. The only thing it's done, it's given me real meaning and purpose in life. And I am so grateful for that. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I put to you in reflecting on that, and I, I followed Tim Tebow when he was a Gator, um, and uh, where he started wearing the black eye, you know, what do they call that? Eye sh- blackout, what, what, whatever. You know, and he had some scripture verses on those. Uh, he, he approached his, his coach um, and, and got permission to do that. How many of you know who his coach was when he was at the Gators? Because I'm drawing a blank on his name. Yeah, thank you. Irvin Meyer. And he said, okay, go for it. He also did that <clears throat> in the pros. And I put to you, like it or not, Tim Tebow's outspoken faith did cost him a career in the NFL. When you look at what he accomplished when he filled in there at the, on the Denver Broncos and took them to the, the playoffs and, and that miraculous finish to that one game um, and, and how shortly after that he kind of just got lost in the shuffle, I really think it was because he was bigger than the team. Everywhere he went, the Christian community, the faith community just rallied around him and his jersey number sold out heads and shoulders over anyone else. And he became bigger than the team. And that doesn't go over so much in the NFL, especially when it's somebody who's outspoken for Jesus Christ. Not just their faith. Outspoken for Jesus Christ. Hopefully, after we finish with the message this morning, you walk away from here with a confidence of knowing that you are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you are willing, regardless of what it might cost you in friendships, regardless of what it might cost you in a job, regardless of what it might cost you financially, you are not going to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's gift to us 
for salvation and for life. There you have the message. You can fall asleep for the next 20 minutes and you still got the take home for today. But if you're interested in going a little deeper, I ask you to take your insert there and to follow along as we're going to travel this Roman road. Now, there's the classic Roman road, right? When I say to some of you who, uh, who like to uh, evangelize your faith, um, have you ever led someone to faith, someone to make that profession of Jesus Christ as their Lord, a lot of times you'll take them through this, what I call the classic Roman road journey. How many of you are familiar with Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many of you are familiar with verse 24? Ah, Because verse 24 says, and have been justified by his gift. Have been justified mm, by his sacrifice on a cross. Have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. But we're on the Romans road. We're on the classic one. So you take them there first. Revealing that sin separates us. And then where do we go? We go to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. And a lot of times people will stop there. But, never, never forget the but. The gift of life is found in Jesus Christ. Ah. So, okay, all right. All sinners, fallen short, deserve death. But there's this gift that we get from Christ. So then we take them back to, don't ask me why they go front and back. But that, this is the Romans road. This is the classic journey. And then Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Read verses 6 and 7 that leads up to that. You know, because it talks about, you know, sometimes you know, people will die for each other, but very rarely will you die for somebody you don't know and all that kind of stuff. But the idea here is, okay, we're all sinners. We deserve death. We can find eternal life in Christ, and you need to understand that while we were still in our sin, Christ still died for us. So it's already a done deal. The question is, are you going to step in and do? And then you lead them to Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our that he raised from the dead, see how that ties in. Confess with our mouth. Believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. Don't miss that, that Jesus is Lord. You know, we're going to get to those four verses and many, many, many more in our journey on the Roman road. But that's the classic. Those are the high points. And if we just go to the high points in Romans, we miss so much. And here, dare I say, in the first chapter, we miss kind of the key central peace to all of that Romans Road stuff. And it's found there in verses 16 and 17. But we're not going to jump to there. We're going to talk about our tour guide. Who wrote the letter? How do you know that? Um, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. <laughs> That's who's writing the letter. And what do we know about Paul as, as our guide here? What are his credentials? What did he say? I am first and foremost a servant of Jesus Christ. The Greek word there, you want to learn some Greek to impress your friends, is doulos. Hmm. Which is the same word that Paul will use in the letter to Philippi, Philippians chapter 2. When he reads through verses 6 through 11, he starts off with, you know, Christ became a servant. Same word. So he's saying, basically, I'm a servant, I'm a, uh, I'm a follower, but most importantly, you know, I am a slave to Christ. He makes the decisions, and I follow his decisions. That's an intimacy there. What else, what else do we know about Paul and, and his credentials? What is he known for? What is he bringing to the forefront here? Um, that he was called to be an apostle, right? Um, basically, he is called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. 
called to be an apostle. You know what apostle means, the meaning of that word? It means a sent one. Paul, where was Paul sent? He was sent to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He started out going to his Jewish brothers and sisters, but they kind of thumbed their nose at him. He said, all right, fine. You want to be like that? I'm going to go to the Gentiles because I need to take the gospel to them too. Why? Because God revealed that to me that I need to do that on that road to Damascus. Because the first message to the Gentiles actually uh, would have it depends whether you call the Samaritan woman a Gentile or not. But bottom line is post-Acts chapter 1. The first message to the Gentiles was from Peter. As he and Cornelius connected and the gospel went to the Gentile community there. Um, you can read, read about that in Acts uh, chapter 9, 10. You, you see Paul's conversion in 9, but you see Peter's message to the Gentile community in chapter 10. He also repeats it later in Acts as well. So we see Paul's credentials here. That he was invited, that he was appointed, that's what called means. And he was set apart, separated, to be that sent one. Now, I'm not an apostle, but I'm an ambassador. See, that's also the connection there I want you to make. Uh, because Paul is the one who wrote the letter to the church at Corinth. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he calls us all who are saved, all who are followers of Jesus Christ, he calls us ambassadors of Christ. He also calls us ministers of the gospel, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. So he goes on to talk about what, what actually kind of is this greeting that he wants to live. And he always talks about grace and peace. Now that's jumping down to the end of verse 7. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a common greeting that Paul uses in a lot of his letters. Not everyone, but in a lot. Why? Because that's what he's bringing. He's bringing a message of peace and grace because it's God's grace to us that we can walk in a relationship with him. God is holy. We are not. <laughs> We're called to be holy. We're called to live righteously, and we'll get into that as we work through this. But we serve a holy and righteous God, and we need to understand that if we wouldn't have the grace, and grace is something you receive that you don't deserve it on the good side. Okay? Mercy is not receiving punishment that you do deserve, but grace is receiving a blessing that you don't deserve. So where mercy is good, grace is even better. I mean, it's nice in God's mercy we don't receive the punishment for our sin, right? Amen? Anybody here you were here desire that you would be held accountable for every thought, word, or deed that you have done that didn't please God? Raise your hand. Why? Because we've done a lot of thinking, speaking, and doing that stinking. Right? Stinking thinking, stinking talking, stinking doing. And if it wouldn't be for God's grace, and yes, God's mercy... But if it wouldn't be for God's grace, we wouldn't have an opportunity for a relationship. We know that, right? Paul knew that. He's taking this message to the church there at Rome. And he's taking this message because he's excited about the Son. He's excited about the descendant of David according to the flesh. He's excited about the only Son of God according to the Spirit who, who demonstrated that with power. Ultimately, power from what? Power over what? Power as demonstrated in what? Resurrection. Paul wrote about resurrection a lot. Paul wrote that if it wouldn't be for the resurrection of Christ, we would be... People to be pitied more than any others because we have believed in a lie. A lie. The resurrection is a key. Hmm. Can I say it this boldly? The resurrection is the key to the authority of Christ and his salvation. Because he prophesied that he would raise again from the dead. And he prophesied 
that you tear down this temple. In three days, I will build it again. He prophesied that I need to go that way in order for the greater good to be met. Read about the prayer in the garden. Can, can you grasp that? Can you understand that? That if it could be proven that the resurrection was a myth, a lie, a, a story that was concocted by this uh, group of Jewish radicals who wanted to create a new religion where they would gain fame and wealth and recognize... Oh, that's right. They were all pretty much persecuted and executed for their faith with the exception of John, who also lived uh, a good bit of his life in exile. And as tradition has it, was once uh, uh, they attempted to kill him by uh, uh, kind of, uh, what, burning him with uh, oil or something like that, and he survived that. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they did this for personal gain because they all got wealth. Oh, that's right. They didn't have a lot of money either in this can you see the ridiculousness of saying that this resurrection of Christ was a made up myth in order for people to get wealthy and to become famous and important in their society <laughs> you see that that's when when you hmm, when you get away from the reality and the truth of the resurrection you you, you start to Get very illogical in your thinking as you try to denounce something that God demonstrated was a miraculous intervention in history that God made. Anyway, just a little tidbit there. So Paul's greeting, I mean, it, it's just he, he's revealing his heart for these people. He's revealing his heart for the people that are on this journey with us. And those, you can see that in verses 8 through 14. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. When's the last time you thank God for somebody in your life that's had an impact in your faith? When's the last time you thank God for somebody he placed in your life that's been an instrument in your own faith journey? I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Why? Because your faith is being reported all over the world. Is Paul an encourager here? Have you ever been encouraged by a fellow believer where they say, hey, I just, I just want to you know, write this little note to you, just to, or I just want to share this with you, just how much of an encouragement you've been to me? How many of you like to collect Christmas cards? Uh, some of you are honest. Um, how many of you still have a Christmas card or more uh, on your windowsill or your china cabinet still out today? Woo -woo. I have one because in it, one of our youth encouraged me by sharing with me the impact that I had in their life as encouraging them. You need to understand, when we encourage each other, it edifies the body. Paul's an encourager here. Paul is, is saying, you know, you guys, you know, I really want to come to see you. Um, you know, God is, is, as he is my witness, I remember you often in my prayers, and also I have been anxious, I've been longing, I've been desiring, that's from verse, verse, uh, verse 11 here, I've been desiring to, to visit with you so that we can grow stronger by my imparting to you that you and I may mutually be encouraged by each other's faith. That's why the author of Hebrews, sometimes people think it was Paul, because what does the author of Hebrews say about meeting together? Chapter 10, verses 23, 4, 5. Do not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but continue to do so, encouraging one another, spurring one another on to love and to good deeds. You see how important it is for us to come together. We're living in a culture where there seems to be a shift going on that says this is no longer necessary. You can do church uh, out in the wilderness. You can do church uh, in your own backyard. You can do church wherever. And, and part of that is true. But there's a reason that we meet together as the body of Christ. And Paul is identifying that here to those who call themselves the church at Rome. We can encourage each other. We, we can strengthen each other. We can hmm, challenge each other as well. And then who, who are our fellow travelers on this? When we see Paul writing this letter, he's addressing it to Greeks and non-Greeks, 
which I prefer the NIV there because we go, go out call people barbarians and see how receptive they are to you <laughs> sharing the gospel with. Don't use the word barbarian, okay? Greeks and non-Greeks alike. I put to you there were also some Jewish brothers and sisters here, probably in the church at Rome. But it was vastly populated uh, by the uh, Greek community. Uh, and non-Greek. So there, there were people in, in Rome that were of a Greek descent, if you want to call it that. But there were also others. And most of those others that would have been there probably were of the slave class because they were taken captive on one of Rome's many conquests because Rome was the kingpin of the area for quite a period of time. And a lot of the first century church, you know where the believers came from? A lot of them, especially in the Gentile community came from the slave class because they needed hope. They needed to be encouraged because they were suffering under the thumb of Rome and their occupation. Hmm. So we see that, verses 14 and 15, these are our fellow sojourners there. Um, And he's so eager to preach the gospel Uh, For those who are at Rome, why? Because he wants to encourage them. He wants to build them up. He wants to identify to them the power that's in the gospel, the the freedom that's in the gospel. And we're going to see this play out as we go through this journey through Romans. We're going to see Paul talk about freedom. We're going to see uh, Paul talk about the, the power that's in the gospel. We're going to see Paul talk about the, the deliverance we have because of the gospel. We're no longer under the law, but we're now under Christ and the grace that comes from that. And then we go to the reason for the journey. Why does Paul share this stuff that he share, shares with this church here at Rome? What is setting the tone for everything that's going to follow? Because this was a letter. It wasn't written in chapter and verse. It was written as a letter. Read it this week as a letter. Uh, And I think there's probably a couple of translations out there. Uh, I'm I'm not real familiar with them. uh, So I don't want to recommend them wholeheartedly. But uh, try and find one that doesn't have the chapter and verses in it. And just read it like a letter. Let me know how that works for you. Um, I, I like chapter and verses so that I can get some <laughs> mooring points so I know, okay, okay, we're going to, well, somewhere around the middle. No, it's in, in Romans chapter 8. We're going to talk about this and that. Those were added as a way of being able to memorize, as being able, uh, enable somebody who's preaching a message, who's teaching a message, to get everybody kind of on the same page right away. They didn't have to know the whole letter. They could know, we'll go to the middle, which is Romans chapter 8. Boom, they'd go to chapter 8. Just a little sidebar there. But what is the power of verses 16 and 17? Paul, and, and understand, he, he talked about, and he's going to flesh out what the gospel is. But, but he introduced this gospel uh, important significance. And he was introducing it to a group of people who knew Jesus. Understand that. This letter, first and foremost, was written to believers. So if you are here this morning as a follower of Jesus Christ, this letter is written to you as well. If you're here seeking to know more about Christ, this letter is written to you as well. If you're seeking and don't know what a relationship with Christ is all about, but you desire it because you've seen how some people live, this letter's for you. Anyway, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Nor was Tim Tebow. Didn't care if it cost him a career in the NFL. And, and, and keep in mind, this is in an era where to be a professional athlete in the 21st century, that was even half good. And not only did it bring you money for playing the game, but all the endorsements. But he was not ashamed of the gospel. He didn't care if it shortened his career because it's more than money. It's about Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power. Don't miss that five-letter word. It is the power of God for the salvation of just the chosen. For the salvation, for just the elect, for the salvation of everyone 
who believe. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Why first for the Jew? Once again, prophetic, Old Testament, read of the prophecies of Christ. He had to fulfill them in order to be the Messiah. He had to fulfill them in order to be the one who would crush the serpent's head. Genesis 3, 15. He came first for the Jew because that was the plan, that was the revelation that God had made to a nation that wasn't a nation, an insignificant people that he called out to be his own. Anyway, for in the gospel, in this good news, in this revelation of God's plan of salvation to us through Jesus Christ, a righteousness from God is revealed. That righteousness that is Jesus, that righteousness that comes from him. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. When Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, understand, his goal when he had this awakening, and these two verses are, are the verses he has cited that brought about his awakening to the... Uh, corruptness of the Catholic Church. At that time, it would have been called the Roman Catholic Church. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He didn't want to have a splintering off because he still believed in the unity of the church. But the unity of the church was not possible. Why? Because those in power, those who sought power for themselves in the Roman Catholic system in that time period would not listen as he wanted to bring reformation and get back to grace and faith alone, not works. Scripture, solo scriptura, scripture alone, not church tradition and teaching. Scripture, Christ, Christ alone, grace, faith, connected, not by works, lest any man should boast. He wrote that to the church at Ephesus, reminding them, that they are saved by faith, not by what they do, but by what they believe. And now naturally, if you believe in the Christ of the scriptures, you will do the works that you have been created since the foundation of the world to do. Can you see that melding? Can you see that balance? Because what is the good news? What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ. It's always been about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. When you make it more than that, you lose sight of the gospel of grace. You lose sight of the gospel who is brought to you through faith and faith alone. You lose sight that it's all about Jesus. And what's the good news? He is Lord. He has defeated death. And he gives us life, life everlasting. He gives us life and life to the full. He gives us a relationship with the holy God. That's grace. That's mercy. That's truth. Because we are all sinners who have fallen short. We are all people who deserve the wages of our sin, which is death. But while we were yet under that condemnation sentence, Christ died for us so that if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So, what about the church here that meets at Dublin Gap? This is a letter written to the church at Rome. How many of you are familiar with our webpage? You know, on our webpage, there is a statement there, five points, not three points, I'm normally a three-pointer, but there are five points there that are listed. And here's what it says about who we are at the Dublin Gap Church. Now, how many of you have been attending, whether you're a member or not, how many of you would call this your home church? Hands up. Both hands up. Okay, for those of you that didn't lift your hands, welcome. We'd like for you to consider making Dublin Gap Church of God that home church. But this is inspection time. Based on what we're being introduced here, are we living unashamedly of the gospel? Are we living a Tim Tebow style of life. I mean, I'm not as gifted as Tim Tebow. 
I don't have the arms of Tim Tebow. I don't have the chest of Tim Tebow. I don't have the wisdom. Pro- well, I don't know. Maybe I could. Yeah. Tim, if you're listening, give me a call sometime. We'll talk about the wisdom side of things. But anyway. Also, if you're listening, you can give me a call and tell me your workout regime too. Uh, but anyway, where's Eli? Where'd Eli go? Because he had an opportunity to listen to Tim speak down at Liberty, right, about three, four weeks ago, months. Anyway, this spring, sometime early spring, late, late winter. Um, but, you know, he'd give all that up if it meant that took him away from the gospel. He'd give it up. Why? Do, do, do you listen to what I read to you? Anyway, so this is inspection time. For those of you that had the hands up in the air that you call Dublin Gap Church your home church, are we living this? Are we standing in the gap with the gospel? Are we living unashamedly in the way we are a friendly church? Do we receive and enjoy people with a hearty welcome? For those of you that didn't raise your hands, when you came here, were you received with a, a smile and a welcome and a how are you doing kind of thing? If you didn't, you need to let me know because then we're going to have a message on that. Um, But are we doing this? Are we living this way? Do we have a general interest, a genuine, general, active interest in those who come and pay us a visit? Are we a growing church? Do we want to reach out to as many people as possible with the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we inviting people to come and grow with us? Are we evangelistic? Are we so focused in believing that the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice that we desire to help everyone? Everyone have a personal relationship with God. That's taking the gospel to where we live, to where we work, to our families who aren't part of this family. Are we a church that is an educational church? Do we provide ongoing teaching? Do we equip our teachers to be effective in the ministry that they've been called to in teaching our young ones and our ones that aren't maybe quite as young as they once were. We don't have old folks here. We have older folks here. Understand that. And that came about as soon as I hit 55. We have older folks here, not old folks. You call yourself an old folk, we need to talk because you're an older folk. Do we as the Dublin Gap Church call ourselves a missionary church? Do we really believe that our emphasis expands as our church expands? Do we believe that God blesses the local church in proportion to the missionary effort put forth? Take a look at those five points. And if you want, I can put this in a PDF and I'll send it out to you uh, so that you can review that. Or just go to our webpage and you'll see it listed there. Or just go to the blue, uh, this is who we are as a church pamphlet that's out in the, if you're curious about it, it's in the pew rack, that's right. Everybody grab one of those blue things, hold it high and wave it. If you're interested in knowing what these are again, just uh, read that. Now, what about you? (laughs) Now, this was a, uh, do we do this as the church at Dublin Gap? Are we living unashamedly of the gospel? How about you? Are you living unashamedly, unashamedly of the gospel? What does it look like for you? Not to be ashamed of the gospel. And how will you live unashamedly this week in light of the message that we received this morning? I can't answer those questions for you. So it becomes a question for me. Will I live unashamedly? Whether I'm buying groceries at Sailors and giving high fives to a friend of mine who works there, Whether I'm officiating at a funeral, whether the person who died was 78 years plus old, or the person that died was 24, or where the person that was died was a pre-born, eight-month, stillborn child. Would I live so unashamedly that I can still say, God is good? And all the time, even in the midst of those kind of tragedies, I can do that if I have made the decision to live unashamedly, unashamedly of the gospel of Jesus Christ.
because he is the author of life. He is the one who has defeated death. He is the one who's made a way. During this time of prayer, that's where I want you to go. I want you just to reflect on where you are when it comes to Jesus Christ. Just take this last week of your life and ask yourself honestly and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you how you, you lived a week of living unashamedly of the gospel or have you lived a week as a closet Christian where you didn't want people to know who you are in Christ. Let the Holy Spirit bring the conviction. That's between you and the Lord. Also during this time of prayer, if you want to come forward to the prayer rail to receive some prayer cover for something. This is the reason why I've canceled my doorbell camera subscription. This brand here during this time of prayer. Uh, remember Jim had a little bit of a health issue this weekend. That's why he's not here here this morning. So uh, just reach out to him. Let him know you're praying for him. Um, He's been through this journey before, but uh, it's, it's some frustration that he's going through right now and some pain, too. So we pray for him. Remember those that Brian mentioned as part of our announcements and as part of that prayer time as well. There's hurting people that need to know that there's a body of believers so in love with Jesus that they will intercede for them in their prayers, just as Paul did for the church at Rome. Come forward to the prayer rail. I am muted during that time. Tim does a good job of doing that. And we'll pray together over whatever's on your mind, whatever God has laid on your heart. If you feel comfortable doing this, I'd ask you can kneel at your pew. Uh, what kneeling does, it just puts us in that more of a servant position. Um, kneeling before holy God. Because the ground that we are standing on here is holy ground. Because the Spirit is here. Let's pray.
everlasting the gift of abundant life. And may we be quick to share it with others. For it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray as all God's children say. Amen. I asked him to leave this because Tam and I were actually just talking about this. How many of you have been here for some of our children's chats when we've had some of the children pray, the closing? And, and we, we have a couple of passionate prayers, very zealous. I mean, it just, just pouring out how much they love Jesus. No prayer is too small for God. And also understand this, we need to have that passion that those little ones have. And I think that's why Jesus said, unless you become like one of these little ones, unless you have the faith of one of these little ones who's unashamed, they could care less about what the rest of you think when they're praying. They just pray. May we have that passion. May we have that faith. May we live that unashamedly going to ask our two song leaders to come forward and lead us in our closing song this morning. But keep in mind, as we're singing this song, To God Be the Glory, if the Holy Spirit's still working on you and you want to come forward to the prayer rail for something, and maybe it's a prayer just of reigniting that passion that you had when you were a young one. Can you bear with me just one more minute? Can I share one more story with you? Just one more? This afternoon... I am going to be officiating at Mason Kelly's service, a celebration of life service. Some of you are familiar with his tragic end, um, car accident, uh, and in a moment he was gone. And talking with the family, they shared this. It was at a VBS program where Mason found Jesus. And was so excited about that the rest of that week and a couple of weeks to follow. He was sharing with everybody about how they need to know Jesus. They need to just read about it in his word. And you can know Jesus like I did. It's the greatest thing you can ever do. That that excitement. Something happened. He didn't walk away from the faith. Understand that but he lost his zeal for it. Makes me think of another 21-year-old. Who lost her life suddenly in an accident. She kept her zeal. She witnessed to my dad often. And between her and her aunt, my youngest of the three sisters I have. They kind of got my dad into the family of God. Don't lose your zeal. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together as we sing to God be the glory. Just so.